Hello and welcome to this fourth lecture in our series covering the BSc Level 1 curriculum. Whereas we've previously used 2D and M-mode imaging in order to build up a picture of the structure and function of the heart, now that it's time to turn our attention to valvular heart disease, we're going to need an additional tool in order to demonstrate the flow of blood as it moves through the circulation. Just as it isn't essential to understand the basic physics of ultrasound in order to produce 2D images, it is possible to use colour Doppler without having a full understanding of how these images are generated. However, just as with 2D imaging, there are some important limitations of using colour Doppler, and we can only really understand these limitations if we understand how the images were produced in the first place. So, over the course of this lecture I'm going to explain how we generate colour maps, and some of the problems we might encounter when using them. This lecture is necessarily quite physics heavy, and as I say, if you don't understand all of the concepts that are described at first watch, that shouldn't be a barrier to you getting out and using this technique. And you can always return to this lecture once you had a bit more experience imaging heart valves. Alright, so let's begin with some physics. So what we want to achieve is a visualisation of the direction and velocity of the blood flow as it moves through the heart. And we're going to use the Doppler effect in order to do this. The Doppler effect states that if the source of a wave is moving relative to the observer, then the frequency of the wave will shift depending on whether the source of a wave is moving towards or away from the observer. Let's get a sense of how that works in practice. So here the observer is our transducer, and the source of our wave is our reflective surface. So in this example we'll take this red blood cell. Now if there's no relative motion between these two, if they're at a fixed distance apart, then the wave that leaves the transducer and strikes the red blood cell will be reflected back towards the transducer with an identical frequency. We can imagine in this example here that each of the green arrows represents the peak of one wave and they're spread evenly apart, and they return spread equally evenly apart when they come back to the probe. Now, let's imagine what happens if the red blood cell is moving away from our probe as the wave strikes it. Here you can see that the frequency of the wave decreases, and you can also appreciate that the magnitude of that shift, the degree to which that shift occurs, will be dependent on the velocity of the red blood cell, how quickly it's moving away from our probe. Likewise, if the red blood cell is moving towards the probe when the wave strikes it, then the frequency of the wave will increase. The gaps between each of the green arrows will shorten. The relationship between the velocity of the blood and the magnitude of the frequency shift is described in the Doppler equation. Let's break this equation down to help us understand it. So, first of all, what do we know? Well, F0 is the frequency of a transmitted wave. That is, the frequency that the ultrasound probe initially generated. And of course, the software knows this. Delta F is the observed shift in frequency. That is, the difference between the measured returning frequency and the known transmitted frequency. And using some clever maths, the ultrasound machine can work this out. C is the speed at which the ultrasound wave was travelling. Now, we know from a previous lecture that the speed of a wave is dependent on the material in which it's travelling through. And different tissues have different propagation velocities. So just like we do for 2D image generation, we make an assumption of an average speed, and so we use the average speed of 1540 meters per second in this equation. Theta is the angle, that is the difference between the direction of travel of the ultrasound wave and the direction of travel of the structure that's moving. So when the blood is moving directly towards or directly away from a probe, then theta will equal zero, and cos of theta will equal one. Now the ultrasound machine doesn't know how well aligned you are to the blood flow. So it assumes perfect alignment, which obviously isn't always the case, assumes that theta equals zero, and places that value into this equation. This means that the only part of the equation that we don't have is the bit that we're trying to work out, and that is the velocity, or the relative velocity between the two structures, the source of our wave, in this case the blood, and our phased array probe. So you can see how using this equation, the ultrasound software is able to derive velocity information from frequency shift. So how can we exploit this principle and use it to generate an image that's practically useful for us, one that demonstrates the flow within the heart? So let's start off by considering how we can determine and represent the flow of blood at a single point in space. So this is an apical four chamber view. Let's imagine that we're interested in the flow of blood from the left atrium to the left ventricle during diastole. We can tell the ultrasound software the specific area that we're interested in. And I'm going to do that by laying a cursor down the length of the left ventricle. And on that cursor, I'm going to have a small bracket that tells the ultrasound software where I'm particularly interested in. And we're going to call this our sample volume. So in this example, let's assume that our sample volume is 10 centimeters from the probe. 
and our sample volume has a length of 6 millimeters. The ultrasound software knows that if it sends out a pulse of ultrasound and it returns before 119 microseconds, then it won't have had time to reach the sample volume and return. Likewise, any signal returning later than 134 microseconds will have been reflected from a structure deeper than the sample volume. It knows to ignore all information returning outside of that window or outside of that gate and only tell us about information that arrives between 119 and 134 microseconds after the pulse was emitted. By sending several thousand pulses of ultrasound along this single scan line each second, the ultrasound software is able to measure the shift in phase between the transmitted and received waves. It can then use the Doppler equation to calculate the velocity which would produce that degree and direction of phase shift. So once the ultrasound machine has deduced the velocity of the moving blood and the direction that that blood's travelling in, either towards or away from a probe, based on whether the frequency has shifted to a higher or lower frequency, it needs to display that information in a way that we can understand it. So for a single point in space it can create a graph like this, where time is displayed across the x-axis and blood velocity is displayed along the y-axis which by convention displays blood moving towards the probe as above the baseline and blood moving away from a probe as below the baseline. This is a common technique used throughout comprehensive echo and is referred to as spectral Doppler. Now, we won't be using spectral Doppler as part of our level 1 scans. However, as we'll see in a minute, this technique of sending out a pulse of ultrasound and then gating the response to isolate a specific region of interest is the technique that the ultrasound software will use to generate colour maps for us. So I think there's some merit in understanding how this is done and it will allow us to go on and discuss some of the strengths and limitations of this technique. OK, so we're trying to demonstrate flow of blood from the left atrium towards the left ventricle. That is, blood flowing towards our transducer. So the baseline's been placed at the bottom of the graph and we're looking at positive velocities. And so you can see that in systole there's no flow from LA to LV as we'd expect. Whereas in diastole we have two discrete peaked triangles which represent two phases of LV filling, early diastole and then atrial systole. Alright, so how can we use pulsed wave Doppler to generate a colour map? Let's start by going back to our apical four chamber view and we're going to lay a box over this image which demarcates the area that we're interested in. And we're going to ask our ultrasound machine to overlay on top of our 2D grayscale image information about flow, velocity and direction. So this 2D image has a depth of 19 centimetres and it's being recorded at 45 frames per second as per the information displayed in the top left hand corner of the image. And so by my estimation there's about 90 scan lines that have gone into making up this 2D image. When we start to generate a colour map the ultrasound machine starts to acquire additional information from those scan lines that pass through our colour box whereas previously it had been principally concerned with the amplitude of a returning signal which is then assigned a brightness value. It now additionally estimates the phase shift. Now it can't estimate phase shift from a single piece of information. It requires multiple values from the same location in order to do this. So those scan lines that pass through the box are rapidly repeated, typically around eight times, before moving on to the next scan line. Once there's been enough time for the scan line to sweep through the colour box, we end up with a grid of values, a grid of estimated velocities, which can then be represented as a colour. By convention, positive velocities, i.e. velocities moving towards the transducer, are represented with a shade of red, whereas negative velocities or velocities away from the transducer are represented with shades of blue, with brighter shades representing faster velocities. So here we are back at our apical four chamber view, and we have two images side by side. On the left we have the plain 2D image, and on the right we have an identical image with a colour box overlaid. You can see from the ECG that the image is frozen at mid diastole, so towards the tail end of early diastolic filling. And we can see a band of dark red becoming bright yellow blood leaving the left atrium, entering the LV. And you can see from the scale on the right hand side that the ultrasound machine is estimating this blood's travelling in the order of about 50 centimetres per second as it's crossing past the mitral valve annulus. Alright, now that we have a basic understanding of how colour Doppler is generated, we can start to consider some of the limitations of this tool. So first of all, all of the data that the ultrasound software uses to generate your colour map comes from returning ultrasound signal. 
so any of the factors that are going to diminish the quality of your two-dimensional ultrasound image, such as body habitus, patient position, and dropout caused by acoustic shadowing, are all going to impair the quality of the data the software gets back, and impair its ability to produce a colour map for you. So the two images we're looking at now are both parastern long axis views, with the image on the left being the 2D and the image on the right having a colour flow box placed over the left atrium in order to capture any mitral regurgitation. And I've chosen this image because the quality of the image overall is pretty poor. This is a patient who's just had a TAVI and has unfortunately deteriorated and has ended up on a mechanical ventilator. So they've got positive pressure ventilation, they're lying supine, and in addition they now have prosthetic material in the aortic valve position that's casting a shadow over part of the left atrium. And that shadow means we have diminished returning signal with which we can build up our two-dimensional image, but it also means we get less signal back with respect to the flow of blood in the left atrium. How can we improve the situation? Well, our solution is to find a view in which the TAVI is no longer casting a shadow over the LA. So if we swap out our left-hand image for an apical four-chamber view, our colour box is now nicely demonstrating the flow of blood. We now have an unobstructed view into the left atrium, and we no longer have those shadows cast across our colour box. So our first limitation is that all of those factors that limit your ability to gather information to build up a 2D image also impact on your ability to gather the information required to build up a colour map. So the second limitation we need to consider is the impact of colour flow mapping on the frame rate. So here we have two apical four chamber views side by side. And these both got identical sector width and sector depth, but the image on the right has the addition of a colour box over the left atrium. And in the top left hand corner of the image we can see the frame rate displayed. So without the colour box we've got a frame rate of 51 frames per second. And then when we add the colour box our frame rate drops to 19. So why is this occurring? So if we highlight in light green here all of the areas in the image that need to have a single scan line sent down them to generate one frame. Because that single scan line is able to provide all of the information required to generate the 2D image. And I'm then going to highlight in dark green all of the areas that have to be scanned multiple times in order to gather enough information to calculate the phase shift and hence estimate the velocity of the blood travelling in that area. You can see that the dark green box overlies not only the area that we're asking for colour information to be displayed but also all of the foreground in front of that box. And when we think about it this makes sense because we can't send ultrasound down to those deep structures without having to pass through the near structures first. So adding colour to your 2D image is going to significantly reduce your frame rate and the biggest determinants of how much your frame rate will decrease are the width of a colour box, because this determines how many lines are involved, and the maximum depth of a colour box, as the maximum depth dictates how long the ultrasound machine needs to wait before it can send out the next pulse of energy. Let's take a quick look at an exaggerated example, which I think will help reinforce this for us. So here we've got two apical five chamber views, both with a sector width of about 90 degrees and a depth of 19 centimetres. And both clips have got a colour box on, and roughly speaking, the colour box occupies a similar sort of area on the image. But the clip on the left, which has a very narrow colour box, has got a frame rate of 24 frames per second, whereas the clip on the right with a very broad, wide colour box has a frame rate of just 11. What would happen to our frame rate if we decided to use a colour box that had a similar width to that on the right here, and a similar depth in the image, but display colour information from all that near field area as well? Well, that's what we've got on the left hand side now, and as you can see, the frame rate is essentially identical. What if we adjust our colour box so that we maintain the same width, but now we're not asking for any colour information from the far field, and we're only asking for information from the near field. That's what we've got on the right hand side now. And as you can see, the frame rate has increased up from 12 frames per second to 20 frames per second. The general guiding principle of setting a colour box size and position is exactly the same as you do for generating a 2D image. So keep your box as small as possible while still covering the entire region of interest. And what we'll do is, when we start to take a look at some valves and some valvular pathology, I'll talk about where I think the colour box should be set in each individual case. OK, so the third limitation that I want to discuss is the phenomenon of a lasing. Now, this can be quite a complicated topic to get your head around, so I'm going to have a crack at explaining the physics of this, but if it doesn't make perfect sense to you at first listen, then it really isn't essential that you understand the physics. But you certainly do need to understand when lasing occurs, and how to recognise it. Put in the simplest of terms, when you're using pulsed wave Doppler, 
there's a maximum velocity that the software can accurately discern. And when the velocity of blood moving through the heart exceeds that value, then the software can no longer work out either the velocity of the blood or the direction in which it's travelling. OK, so let's have a look at why this occurs. All right, so let's imagine that there is a wave returning to our probe, and we want to work out the frequency of that wave. Well, if we can see the whole wave, then it's relatively straightforward. All we need to do is work out the duration of one period, time between two peaks, and then our frequency will simply be the reciprocal of this. But what if we can't see the entirety of a wave? If we sample the returning wave's amplitude at regular intervals, then we might be able to get enough information to build up a picture of what that wave looks like. So here we have eight green axes, and by knowing the position of these eight green axes, we're able to describe the wave which must have created them. Is it possible that there could be another wave with a longer wavelength and shorter frequency that could have produced the same distribution of samples? Well, in this case, the answer is no. The frequency with which we sampled our wave means that we have just over two sample points per period. And as long as, on average, we have greater than two sample points per period, it's not possible to confuse our wave with one of a lower frequency. It is, however, possible to find waves of a higher frequency that would be consistent with the samples that we've taken. And here's one such example. As you can see with this new wave, we've sampled it less than twice per period. So from our eight sample points, we're able to produce two regular sine waves with very different frequencies. If all the information we have to go on is those eight sample points, then we don't know which of these waves is correct. But what we do know is that the sine wave that's currently visible at the top of your screen has the lowest possible frequency that could be correct. But waves with higher frequencies are plausible. So we can appreciate that the frequency with which we can sample the wave is paramount in being able to accurately describe it. So I guess the important next question is how frequently can we sample our wave when we're using colour Doppler? So let's take this example. Here we have an apical 5 chamber view and printed on the display it's giving us two important pieces of information. It's telling us a frequency of a transmitted wave, which here is 2.5 MHz, and it's giving us a value called the pulse repetition frequency. That is the number of lines it can draw into and out of the colour box per second. And here it's giving us a value of 4923 Hz. That is, the ultrasound machine is able to sample the information in the colour box 4923 times each second. The pulse repetition frequency is limited by the maximum depth of the colour box. So in this example I've placed the colour box such that I'm asking for colour information from a maximum depth of about 13.6 centimetres from a probe. Knowing that the sound waves are going to be travelling at 1540 metres per second, I know that my waves need to be spread apart with a gap of at least 177 microseconds to stop them overlapping. Now I've got a pulse repetition period of 177 microseconds then I'm going to be able to have 5,650 pulse repetitions per second. In actuality, I'm measuring a pulse repetition frequency slightly lower than this, just shy of 5,000. And I suspect the fact that we're not hitting 5,500 pulse repetitions per second is probably related to the fact that we need a little bit of processing time in the ultrasound machine in between each wave. What's the significance of these values? Well, let's go back to our transmitted wave, the wave we sent out from our probe. And here you can see it has a frequency of 2.5 MHz, and so it therefore has a period of 0.4 microseconds. So if we wanted to accurately describe a wave of this frequency, building it up from multiple sample points, we'd need to sample it at least 5 million times per second in order to accurately do that. In fact, if this is our wave, and this is our first sample point here, then we're not going to get to sample this wave again until over 500 periods have elapsed. So instead of measuring the frequency of a returning wave, when using pulsed wave Doppler, what we measure is phase shift. How different is the returning signal from the one that we transmitted? How different is the returning signal from what we would expect to see if a returning signal returned unchanged? So here we have a graph where we've plotted on the x-axis the relative velocity and on the y-axis the resulting shift in frequency. So what's important to us now is the relationship between the frequency shift and the pulse repetition frequency. Are we able to sample the shift in frequency quickly enough that we can accurately describe it? We know that to accurately describe a wave we need to sample it twice per period. So let's use the numbers from our example and see if this holds true. 
So in our clip we had a pulse repetition frequency of 4923 Hz. So that's our sample frequency. Now half that value, 2461.5 Hz, is what we're going to call our Nyquist limit. That is the maximum frequency shift that we can accurately describe. Because any frequency shift greater than that, well we're not going to be able to sample it quickly enough. Well, then we have to ask what velocity of blood would bring about a shift in frequency of 2461.5 Hz. And we can work that out using the Doppler equation, which gives us a value of 75.8 centimeters per second. So any velocity up to 75.8 centimeters per second is going to produce a frequency shift that's within our detectable range. But any velocity in excess of this value will produce a frequency shift that we can't accurately describe. So here's our same clip again, and if you look on the far right of the image you can see the colour scale displayed. And you can see that the ultrasound software is telling you that with the settings as they are here, the maximum velocity that can be displayed is the 75.8 cm per second that we anticipated. When the observed velocity exceeds the upper bounds of the scale, this is when a lasing occurs. Let's have a look at what this looks like on a different clip. OK, so here's another apical 5 chamber, this taken from a healthy volunteer. And on the left hand side of the image we can see that our transmitted wave has a frequency of 2.5 MHz and our pulse repetition frequency is 4000 Hz. And if we have a look at the scale on the right hand side of the image we can see that the maximum discernible velocity in either direction is 61.6 cm per second. Alright, so let's freeze our image at n diastole and then let's advance frame by frame watching the blood as it travels from the left ventricle down into the left ventricle outflow tract and passes through the open aortic valve. So this is blood that's moving away from the probe and so relative to the probe it has a negative velocity, a negative frequency shift. And so we'd like the ultrasound machine to demonstrate this blood flow using the blue part of the colour spectrum. So here we can see that systole is just beginning, we're just past the QRS complex on the ECG and we have blood that is moving from the LV towards the aorta and it's all displayed as a dark blue so it's initially moving relatively slowly. Now because this is a healthy heart the pressure inside the left ventricle rapidly increases and the velocity of blood leaving the LV starts to accelerate. As the blood is funneled into the left ventricular outflow tract it has a smaller and smaller area to pass through and so to get that same volume of blood to keep moving it has to accelerate and now we can see that in this very next frame the dark blue has given way to brighter blue which represents faster moving blood and then this bright blue area suddenly flips into a bright yellow and what's happened is the blood has now accelerated beyond 61.6 centimeters per second and it's now traveling too quickly to be correctly identified the software inaccurately imagines that it's seeing blood traveling in the opposite direction which obviously can't be the case this is a perfectly normal finding when visualising blood leaving the left ventricle, as blood travelling through the left ventricle outflow tract usually travels at a velocity somewhere in the order of 1 meter per second. Whilst we can't turn the scale up beyond the Nyquist limit, we can decrease the portion of the scale that we're using if we're looking for particularly slow flow. Now in focused echo we rarely have to do this, but you should be aware that it is possible. One situation where I do do this in comprehensive studies is to look for flow between the atria. And here we have a TOE image, this is a bicable TOE view, where the left atrium is in the near field and the right atrium in the far field. And flow between the atria is often relatively slow compared to flow between other chambers of the heart. And so I've turned the scale down in order to better demonstrate this PFO. Like I say, if you're using colour just for focused echocardiography, you probably won't need to do this very often but you should be aware that your machine will allow you to do it. Another way you can alter the way in which colour information is displayed is by adjusting the baseline. So let's go back to our apical 5 chamber view where we'd already demonstrated that the maximum discernible velocity in either direction is 75.8 cm per second and we've seen why this is the case. Now as the blood starts to travel beyond this velocity the software imagines that it's seeing blood moving in the opposite direction again at the upper limit of the scale but we can instruct our ultrasound machine to display these higher velocities as not moving towards us but moving away from us. We can redefine how we'd like it to demonstrate frequency shift information. So in this clip the baseline has been adjusted such that 
negative velocities up to 123 centimeters per second can be displayed. But the flip side of this is that we can only display positive velocities, velocities towards the probe, up to 28.4 centimeters per second. If we freeze our clip in peak systole, where the blood is rapidly traveling towards the left ventricle outflow tract, we can see that we can correctly identify the direction of travel of all of the blood in this area. However, if we then advance the clip to diastole and look at LV filling, this too is now displayed as blue, incorrectly identified as blood traveling away from the probe, because we've exceeded the very modest upper limit of the scale. Is it useful to adjust the baseline in order to reduce the lasing in focused echo? In my own practice, I'd have to say that it's pretty unusual that I'd ever do this. I think when you first start using color Doppler, it can be quite tricky to get your eye in to, to recognize what information is being displayed and what's happening inside the heart. And adjusting the way the color is displayed is probably going to only introduce more confusion at first. So I would probably recommend leaving the baseline in the center, having an equal amount of a spectrum both above and below the baseline, especially when first using this technique. So the fourth and final limitation that we need to discuss relates to the significance in the difference between the direction of the ultrasound beam and the direction that the blood is moving. So in this animation, let's imagine that our man is trying to calculate the speed of the ball as it orbits him. But as it moves around him, it's at a fixed distance from him, getting no closer and no further away. So if he were using reflected waves in order to estimate speed, there would be no change in the reflected wavelength and the apparent velocity would be zero. Let's have a look at another example. So now our man is observing a car, which is traveling at 45 degrees to the angle at which he's observing. As it passes in front of him, it's traveling at a speed of 9.2 meters per second. But because not all of the motion is directly towards the man, he underestimates how quickly the car's moving and measures just 6.5 meters per second. The difference between the angle of observation and the angle of motion is described by the angle theta, and we can see that as that angle increases, we will continue to further underestimate the velocity of the moving target. The degree to which we underestimate velocity can be calculated by calculating the cosine of theta, and this graph nicely shows that as the angle increases, the degree to which we underestimate velocity approaches and then reaches 100%. Let's take a look at some ultrasound clips utilizing color Doppler that really demonstrate this. So here we have two clips from the same healthy volunteer. On the left a parastatal long axis and on the right an apical 5 chamber view. And in both of these clips we have a color box over the left ventricle outflow tract and we can freeze these clips at peak systole to try and visualize the blood leaving the left ventricle heading for the aorta. So in our parastatal long axis the ultrasound machine has demonstrated the blood in the outflow tract is moving very slowly using only shades of very dark red. Whereas in our apical 5 chamber view where the blood is moving away from a probe and therefore should be demonstrated with shades of blue, we've got a lasing occurring long before the outflow tract as the blood passing through here has already exceeded the maximum that the scale allows. If we compare the direction of the ultrasound beam with the direction of blood flow, we can see that in the parastatal long axis view the blood is traveling almost at right angles to the ultrasound beam whereas in the apical 5 chamber view we've achieved much better alignment. In both of these examples the true velocity of the blood will be underestimated, but much more in our parastatal long axis view. So that just about wraps it up for this lecture, and I think we'll just finish by reviewing what we've covered today. So, in summary, when we fire ultrasound into our patients, we can get information about the timing and amplitude of a returning signal, but also by assessing the frequency shift or phase shift, we can get information about whether or not the reflective structure was moving towards or away from a probe. Using multiple pulses along multiple lines, we can build up a grid of information and then convert this to a color display, which allows us to easily see the blood moving through the heart. By tradition, we can use the color red to display blood moving up towards a probe and blue to display blood moving away from a probe. There are a number of key limitations that you need to be aware of if you're going to use color maps. So firstly, color maps are made up of the same ultrasound waves that make up 2D images. So anything that's going to reduce your 2D image quality, such as patient position, body habitus, positive pressure ventilation, will all have a negative impact on your ability to generate color information. Secondly, one of the most obvious drawbacks of using a color box is the impact it has on your frame rate and it will typically cause your frame rate to drop by about two thirds. The larger your box, the more of an impact this will have, and so whenever you are using color, you should have a think about the size and position of the box. Does it need to be as big as it is? 
As a general rule of thumb, you do need to cover the entire area that you're interested in, but your box should be no bigger than that. Thirdly, when using pulse Doppler, there's a maximum velocity that can be accurately displayed, and even in healthy patients, the velocity of blood that moves through the heart will frequently exceed this limit. A lasing will occur and you'll need to recognise this. And finally, the difference between the direction of blood flow and the direction of your ultrasound beam will have an impact on how much the true velocity is underestimated. Putting these last two limitations together, I'd recommend that you don't use colour Doppler to estimate velocity within the heart, but rather to get a general impression of the volume of blood flowing, direction of travel and timing within the cardiac cycle. Okay, so despite this being a necessary oversimplification, I appreciate this lecture has been very physics heavy, and in the next lecture we'll try and make it a lot more practical, as now that we've added colour flow to our toolbox we can start having a look at the valves and thinking about valvular lesions that are significant in our acutely unwell patients.